Imagine, if you will, stepping into a time machine, setting the coordinates for the heart of the Gilded Age. America's era of unprecedented industry and affluence that forged the most iconic old money families. And, amid the titans of the time, beyond the Rockefellers, Carnegies, Astors and Mellons, there looms a name that might surprise you. Gould. Indeed, Jay Gould, that infamous architect of fortunes whose audacious maneuvers in finance and railroads arguably gave us the phrase robber baron. But Gould's tale doesn't just end with that moniker. At the zenith of his power, he was a force so formidable that he came breathtakingly close to cornering the entire gold market. A feat so fantastical that it threatened to bring President Ulysses S. Grant to his knees. On today's episode, we become your tour guides into the opulent and infamous world of Jay Gould and his descendants. Through their eyes, you will witness the fierce battles for supremacy in business, the lavish lifestyles that only unimaginable wealth could afford, and the intricate strategies of power and influence that turn the wheels of the nation's progress, painting a vivid picture of an era where ambition knew no bounds and the quest for dominance was the ultimate game. Thus, their legacy, marked by extravagant multi-billion dollar successes and spectacular falls from grace, offers a window into the tumultuous period that gave rise to America's wealthiest dynasties, as we describe the Goulds, the old money family that went from riches to rags and back again. Jay Gould, a titan of American railroads and a wizard of finance, stitched his name into the fabric of the late 19th century with a fortune so vast, it's hard to wrap your head around it. Picture 71.2 billion in today's dollars, enough to make Midas blush. Therefore, Gould wasn't just rich, he was a cornerstone of America's transportation revolution, playing the market with the finesse of a seasoned gambler. And his empire wasn't confined to ledgers and stock certificates. Gould's penchant for splendor was nowhere more evident than in his choice of digs, with Lyndhurst Mansion being the jewel in his crown. Perched by the Hudson in Tarrytown, New York, this Gothic revival masterpiece, enveloped in its own 67-acre wonderland, was more than a home. It was a statement. Acquired in 1880, Lyndhurst was a canvas for Gould's grandeur, boasting turrets and designs that broke the mold of conventional architecture. Thus, his tenure at Lyndhurst, though marred by tuberculosis, was a time of opulence and refinement, evidenced by the treasures within Herter Brothers furniture, Tiffany windows, and paintings straight out of the Nerdler gallery. After Gould's departure in 1892, Lyndhurst's legacy continued through his daughters, Helen and Anna, who infused it with their personal touches, modernizing and memorializing the estate. Now, a national historic landmark, Lyndhurst stands as a preserved slice of history, inviting us into the world of one of America's most intriguing magnates. But Gould's reach extended beyond the realms of real estate and railroads. His dominion over Western Union gave him the keys to the kingdom of information, allowing him to manipulate news flow and silence critics. Indeed, Gould's dance with politics was a delicate one, involving backroom dealings and, reportedly, the greasing of presidential palms. And Jay Gould's belief in the United States' economic future not only shaped his business maneuvers, but also etched a path for his descendants, weaving their way into the tapestry of global power and prestige. The marriages of his family members, notably Anna Gould's ties with European nobility through her marriages to Bonnie de Castellan and then to Haley de Talleyrand Perigord, Duke of Sagan, mirrored the Gould family's societal elevation and their unbroken strand of influence. Not to be overshadowed, Helen Vivian Gould's union with John Graham Hope Delapour Horsley Beresford, a scion of British nobility, underscored the family's entrenched status among the world's elite, bridging continents and cultures. These days, the torch of the Gould legacy has been carried forward by their business ventures, particularly through Kingdon Gould III. A beacon of the family's legacy, Kingdon's forays into Washington, D.C. real estate, including the legendarily opulent Mayflower Hotel, highlight the Goulds' unyielding influence on the economic stage. However, 
needless to say, this family isn't exactly the household name that the Rockefellers or Mellons have continued to be. With that in mind, what exactly happened to this once $70 billion behemoth of a family that led them to fade into obscurity? To answer that, we'll have to turn over the proverbial page to the next chapter. The man who would come to be known in history as much for his infamy as his fame was born, Jason Gould. Born on the 7th of May, 1836, in Roxbury, New York. And regardless of his later controversial exploits, without a doubt the life of Jay Gould represents the classic rags-to-riches American ethos. As his journey began in a setting far removed from the bustling centers of finance and industry in a family of modest farmers in western New York. Now, John Burr Gould, Jay's father, balanced his life between farming and milling, participating actively in community development. And notably, he was the first male child of European descent born in Roxbury, remembered for his contributions to local education. Mary Moore, Jay's mother, brought to the family a heritage of Scottish settlers known for their strong religious convictions and perseverance. For this, Jay inherited from her a blend of religious fervor and a softer side that would occasionally manifest in his later business dealings. Despite their humble circumstances, Jay Gould's early life was supported by his parents' commitment to his education and development. This support enabled him to attend local schools and further his studies at Beechwood and Hobart seminaries, where he was exposed to classical languages. Undoubtedly, this educational background was somewhat exceptional for a farmer's son, suggesting his parents recognized and nurtured his potential beyond their agricultural setting. Growing up in Roxbury, Gould's early years revealed a sharp intellect and a natural inclination towards commerce, setting him apart from his peers. And the political and social upheavals of the time, particularly his father's involvement in the anti-rent movement, challenging the remnants of feudal land practices in New York, likely had a significant influence on Gould fostering a sense of determination and the importance of securing one's interests. Then, the trajectory of Gould's career took a decisive turn with his initial foray into the business realm, starting in a blacksmith's shop. And his business acumen quickly shone through, leading to an offer of partnership, which he later parlayed into a sale to his father. This early venture into commerce provided Gould with invaluable insights into the mechanics of business, laying the groundwork for his later exploits. Yet, perhaps most telling of Gould's early professional endeavors was his mastery of surveying, which he adeptly turned into a lucrative vocation. His surveying work across New York's southern counties culminating in the publication of a history book at the age of 19, not only highlighted his expertise, but also his knack for leveraging his talents to full advantage. The young entrepreneur's skills in surveying came to the forefront when he taught himself the trade and turned it into a profession. As Gould's entrepreneurial spirit flourished, he ventured into the tanning industry in the 1850s. With the savings he had accumulated, Gould opened a tannery in Pennsylvania, aligning himself with Zadok Pratt, a veteran in the field with the experience of running the world's largest tannery at one time. And though their collaboration was brief, it proved to be a critical learning curve for Gould, enriching his business management acumen. The dissolution of this partnership led Gould to New York City, the pulsating heart of America's financial universe, where he dived into stock market speculation. His subsequent foray into Wall Street was in partnership with Charles Loop, a seasoned leather merchant. This venture, however, met a grim fate in the panic of 1857, leaving Loop ruined and Gould's reputation tarnished. Yet, undaunted by these early challenges, Gould's resolve only strengthened. Convinced of the fortunes waiting to be made in New York City, he remained unshaken in his pursuit of success, as he would soon find his calling in a burgeoning industry of the time, the railroads. Jay Gould's foray into the railroad sector marked the beginning of what would evolve into a monumental chapter in his pursuit of wealth and influence. Starting in 1859, Gould dipped his toes into the waters of railroad stocks, laying the groundwork for a venture that would eventually crown him a titan of the industry. And his engagement in the railroad realm took on a more pronounced form during the tumultuous years of the American Civil War, a period ripe 
with economic disarray, yet brimming with opportunities for those shrewd and tenacious enough to seize them. By 1863, Gould had etched his name as a noteworthy figure in the business world through his management of the Rensselaer and Saratoga Railway. His adept handling of this venture paved the way for his acquisition and reformation of the Rutland and Washington Railway, further cementing his stature within the industry. Subsequently, Gould's ascendancy continued unabated, and by 1867 he had secured a director's seat at the Erie Railroad, setting the stage for one of his most audacious and notorious exploits. But Gould's tenure with the Erie Railroad was marked by brazen financial stratagems that would etch his name into the annals of American business law. The Erie Railroad War, a vehement struggle for dominion over the Erie Railroad, cast Gould into the spotlight as a formidable adversary. Alongside James Fisk, Gould engaged in a series of cunning maneuvers to thwart Cornelius Vanderbilt, deploying fraudulent stock issuances and manipulating legal and political avenues to diminish Vanderbilt's influence over the railroad. Indeed, this skirmish not only cemented Gould's repute as a financial sorcerer, but also highlighted his readiness to employ any means necessary to safeguard his ventures. Yet, it was Gould's venture into the gold market that truly exemplified his boldness and strategic finesse. The infamous Black Friday of 1869 saw Gould and Fisk concoct a plan to monopolize the gold market, driving up prices through accumulation and disinformation, all while betting against the likelihood of government intervention. Gould's audacity reached new heights as he sought insider knowledge from President Ulysses S. Grant's circle, aiming to stay one step ahead of federal actions. Despite their initial success, with gold prices skyrocketing, the government's decisive sale of significant gold reserves under Grant's directive caused the market to plummet, leading to widespread financial devastation. Gould, through cautious hedging, managed to sidestep personal catastrophe, but the debacle left an enduring stain on his legacy, showcasing the volatile nature of unbridled financial speculation. Thus, Gould's business endeavors, marked by a blend of brilliance and moral ambiguity, reveal a pattern of ambitious acquisitions and financial gambits. Through the Erie Railroad War, he demonstrated a relentless drive to manipulate systems to his benefit, a precursor to the bold tactics he would later employ. His attempt to corner the gold market underscored his penchant for risk and innovation, setting him apart from his peers. However, these ventures also painted Gould as a figure whose relentless quest for dominance often skirted the boundaries of ethics, leaving a complex legacy that intertwines ingenuity with controversy. Now, Jay Gould's ascendancy to the zenith of financial success culminated in an amassed fortune, estimated at a staggering $77 million, an amount that, in contemporary terms, translates to many billions, as mentioned in the beginning of this video. His financial dominion extended across various pivotal sectors of the American economy, most notably railroads, telegraphy, and even the media, with significant stakes in the Union Pacific Railroad, Western Union Telegraph Company, and ownership of the New York World newspaper. Yet, despite Gould's undeniable prowess in wealth accumulation and his substantial contributions to the American economic landscape, especially in the realms of railroad expansion and modernization, his name became synonymous with the pejorative moniker, Robber Baron. This label, emblematic of the era's most ruthless capitalists, clung to Gould and his peers, who were perceived as exploiting labor, manipulating markets, and engaging in bribery to amass vast fortunes, often at the public's expense. However, no matter what our opinions of his tactics are, it is clear that Jay Gould emerged a very rich man, ready to pass a hefty legacy onto his children. In the next chapter, we'll find out whether they were able to keep the fortune growing, like the Rockefeller and Mellon descendants did, or if they would falter. George J. Gould's entrance into the world on the 6th of February, 1864, in New York City, marked the assumed continuation of a legacy shaped by his father, J. Gould. However, unlike the meticulously planned successions of today's old money scions, there was little indication that Jay Gould deliberately prepared George to inherit the empire. Yet, 
we're on solid footing to assume the environment George grew up in naturally inclined him towards the path tread by his father. Inheriting the reins in 1892, George took over a sprawling network that included the Missouri Pacific and Texas and Pacific Railroads, among others. But George's tenure was marked by ambitious but ultimately unfulfilled visions, such as the creation of a transcontinental railroad system. This dream, grand in scope, was marred by a lack of concrete financial and operational planning, and his approach to expansion was fraught with strategic missteps, notably an aggressive push for growth without the necessary capital, which overstretched the empire's resources and hampered its competitiveness. Under George's watch, the Gould Railroads grappled with outdated infrastructure and inefficiencies, lagging behind rivals that prioritized modernization and operational excellence and his failure to adapt to the fast-evolving landscape of the American railroad industry, particularly evident in his handling of economic downturns like the Panic of 1907, further destabilized the empire. Therefore, unlike his father, whose knack for market manipulation and strategic acumen was legendary, George's decisions often reflected a lack of the same depth of insight, leaving the empire vulnerable to financial turmoil. Furthermore, George's laissez-faire management style contributed significantly to the decline of the Gould Empire. This approach led to strategic drift and operational neglect, allowing problems like corruption and maintenance issues to flourish unchecked, a stark departure from Jay Gould's tightly controlled empire. The resulting deterioration in service quality and customer trust further diminished the competitiveness of the Gould Railroads. In other words, the cumulative effect of these strategic blunders was the loss of control over the family's railroad holdings. And the financial disarray brought on by George's leadership forced the Goulds to cede several key railroads, marking a dramatic fall from prominence in the American railroad industry. However, while George was bungling up the family fortune, the women of the Gould family were using a bit more tactful approach to the old money game through strategic marriages and working their way into the aristocracy. Anna Gould, born into the opulence and controversy surrounding her father, Jay Gould captured the public's imagination not solely through her inheritance, but also via her marriages to European aristocracy. In 1895, she entered into matrimony with Bonnie de Castellan, a French nobleman emblematic of old world title holders who sought to fortify their waning fortunes through alliances with new world wealth. Indeed, this marriage represented a quintessential Gilded Age transaction, merging the financial might of America's new money with the storied pedigrees of European nobility. And the union of Anna and Boney was marked by opulence and public fascination with their Parisian residence, the Palais Rose, standing as a testament to their extravagant lifestyle. However, the marriage deteriorated due to Bonnie's prodigal spending habits and unfaithfulness, culminating in their divorce in 1906. Anna's subsequent marriage to another aristocrat, Elie de Talleyrand Perigord, Duke of Sagan, in 1908, marked her second alliance with European nobility, further elevating her social stature despite initial familial reservations given Ailey's relation to Boney and his less illustrious paternity. Unlike her first marriage, Anna's union with Haley proved to be more harmonious and enduring. Next, Marjorie Gould, a niece of Anna, also navigated the marriage market to bolster the Gould family's societal position through her union with Anthony Joseph Drexel III in 1910. This alliance with the Drexel banking dynasty underscored the strategic matrimonial choices that fortified the Gould's social standing in both American and European circles. And Helen Gould, another distinguished member of the Gould lineage, furthered the family's entrenchment in nobility through her marriage to John Graham Hope de la Poer Horsley Beresford, the fifth Baron Deces, in 1911. To provide a bit more context, these matrimonial strategies were emblematic of a broader phenomenon during the Gilded Age, where marriages between American heiresses and European nobles were orchestrated not just for love, but for the mutual benefits they offered. Financial stability for the aristocracy and an entree into the elite social echelon for America's nouveau riche. The Gould family's forays into such unions thus mirrored the ambitions and societal aspirations of America's wealthiest clans, seeking to cement their legacy and prestige 
through connections that spanned the Atlantic, blending the rugged individualism of American enterprise with the ancient traditions of European aristocracy. In some ways, we could say these marriages also saved the Gould legacy, for from them birthed later generations of influential, if somewhat poorer, descendants in many fields across the world. The modern Gould family, with its roots deeply entrenched in the industrial and financial bedrock of American history, branched into various spheres of influence and achievement, from the cutthroat arenas of business established by Jay Gould to the refined realms of sport and public service navigated by his descendants. For example, Kingdon Gould Sr. and Jay Gould. The second exemplify the evolution of this dynastic tale, embodying the transition from the aggressive pursuit of wealth to the cultivation of genteel interests and public stewardship. Kingdon Gould Sr., born into privilege in 1887 in Manhattan, emerged as a figure who seamlessly blended the financial legacy of his lineage with a passion for the social and sporting life that defined American high society in the early 20th century. A product of the prestigious Columbia University, his education in engineering paved the way for his stewardship of the family's railroad interests and his valorous service during World War I. And beyond his professional endeavors, Kingdon Sr. was renowned for his prowess in polo, a sport that symbolized the leisure and competitive spirit of the elite. Furthermore, his marriage to Annunziata Camilla Maria Lucci broadened the familial and social connections of the Goulds, ensuring the legacy's continuation through their children, among them Kingdon Gould Jr., who we'll cover in a second. And Jay Gould II, Kingdon Sr.'s sibling, charted a path in another historically elite sport. His acclaim was garnered not in the boardrooms of industry, but on the court tennis fields, where his extraordinary skill earned him a championship reign that spanned over two and a half decades, and even an Olympic gold medal. His triumphs in court tennis, starting from a precocious national title win at 17, attested to a dedication that paralleled the industrious spirit of his grandfather, albeit within the confines of sport rather than finance. Yet, the achievements of Jay Gould II in the sporting domain did not insulate him from personal trials, as his life was prematurely curtailed by illness, a poignant reminder of the vulnerabilities that lie beneath the surface of public success. The continuum of the Gould legacy was furthered by Kingdon Gould Jr., who transitioned from the familial heritage of financial and sporting accomplishment to a career defined by political and diplomatic service. His roles as ambassador to Luxembourg and the Netherlands were not merely diplomatic postings, but represented the Gould family's enduring influence within the tapestry of American public life. Kingdon Jr.'s diplomatic tenure, especially during the tumultuous period of Nixon's resignation, highlighted the adaptability that have characterized the Goulds across generations. The legacy persisted through Kingdon Gould III, who carved out a significant niche within the real estate development sector, particularly in the bustling environs of Washington, D.C. As a key figure in the Gould Property Company, founded by his father, Kingdon III steered the firm to prominence in the D.C. metropolitan landscape. His stewardship was marked by his role in spearheading projects like the Hyatt Regency Crystal City Hotel and the iconic Mayflower Hotel, both of which have left a lasting impact on the city's architectural and commercial development. Kingdon III's entrepreneurial vision was further manifested in the partnership with Boston Properties, culminating in the development of Market Square North. This project, completed in 1997, not only enhanced the Pennsylvania Avenue National Historic Site, but also exemplified his ability to blend historical preservation with modern development. Additionally, his strategic foresight in executing a land swap deal with the District of Columbia paved the way for the construction of the Washington Marriott Marquis. This hotel, serving as a central hub for the Walter E. Washington Convention Center, underscored Kingdon III's influential role in shaping the real estate and hospitality sectors in Washington, D.C., thus continuing the Gould legacy of impactful contributions across generations. Thus, the Gould family legacy, spanning from Jay Gould's notorious rise as a Gilded Age tycoon to his descendants' diverse pursuits in sports, diplomacy, real estate, and even European aristocracy, 
embodies the complexity of American success. While Jay's ruthless business tactics earned him wealth and infamy, his descendants diversified this legacy through contributions to sportsmanship, public service, and urban development, blending ambition with societal engagement, but also navigating the controversies inherited from their forebears' tumultuous career. And now, we'd love to see you in the comments. Which Gilded Age old money family would you like us to feature next on this channel? We've already covered the Rockefellers, the Astors, the Mellons, the Morgans, the Carnegies, and now the Gould family. We can't wait to hear your thoughts. And thanks again for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury.